Hi, Ansa. Welcome. Where I'm a little bit on, I'm er, on a little early because I just want to make sure everything's prepared. We have a guest speaker, and I just want to make sure that um, let me see the waiting room. I get to see everybody in. Hello, Jana, Jana Ridenour. Welcome. Ah, I wonder if there's a way that I can admit everyone to the waiting room. You know what? You guys are lucky. I think I will. Yeah, you guys are in. I think I will. Oh, am I unmuted? Okay, you guys are muted. All right. We are recording. One person is waiting. Hi, Alitha. Welcome. We're all just waiting here. So. Here, welcome. <laughs> this I'm Nikki Shouter. Um, so we every month, if you're new to us, we're Permaculture Gardens, and every month we're trying to get, um, provide just education about permaculture to whoever's interested by hosting these free webinars. My husband and I, and we invite guests. Most of the time, it'll be us. We're just lucky to get to know um, Melissa on our uh, recent road trip, and so. That's what this is about. But if you guys have any questions, there is a chat box on the lower central portion here, or you can just unmute yourself and feel free to say where you're, you're coming from and what brings you here. And while I do that, I'm going to, um, I'm going to just check the emails because Sometimes people last minute forget their Zoom links and I wanna make sure I catch all the emails that come. All right, okay. I think everybody's good. And I'm gonna send out one last email to make sure that people know that we're starting. So if you have any questions about your garden, feel free to chime in. Right now, we are we are we grow in Zone Seven B around um, the Washington D.C. area, and we are currently harvesting lettuce, lots of cilantro, um, and radishes. So our daikons that we planted in the fall are coming like to full size right now, and so that's interesting. Uh, Swiss chard, some Swiss chard, a lot of it's died down. So, all right, let me see who else is here on the in the room. Hi, Dave. Hello. <laughs> um, I am. Okay, so there's a lot of uh. A lot of people have joined in early and like I told you guys if anybody has a question that you want to you want to um, talk about now you can do it as we wait for Melissa to come on usually this is our meet and greet so let us know where you're growing um, what zone or what zip code or what state you're growing in and what you're growing right now if you are growing anything at all or um, how many years you've been gardening for or what brings you here Feel free to use the chat box. So Dave will be the main person on the chat box answering a lot of your questions. Oh, you're also Nikki Shouter. <laughs> your name is Dave. <laughs> but that will be Dave. Do you want to you want to log in as you, Dad? Dave? Oh, you're on 
What did you say? I think it's a little uh, confusing because I was playing around with my normal registration and uh, when I canceled it, I think it, um, I, I'm having trouble coming in as myself, but uh, okay. I can try it. All right, try again. Hi, Tegan. Hi, Carol. Welcome. So this is just like, uh, I was just, we were just, I was just talking to Dave. He's going to come back in again and try to be a different, his actual name appears so that you guys know that he's replying to you when the chat box starts happening. So in the lower right hand side, you'll see, you'll have the ability to chat and ask questions as Melissa presents a little later. And I will repeat this again at eight o'clock, but if you guys stay till the end, it's exciting tonight because we're, we're giving away her consulting service um, remotely. So you, you guys can call. Here, here's Dave. There you are. You guys can call her and discuss your particular garden situation. I don't know exactly how it works, so she can probably tell you a little bit more. And then she'll follow up with an email with a detailed email of what to do next in your garden. So that's exciting. There, you're back as yourself. <laughs> I unmuted you. Hi, I am in British Columbia and my garden will be on Salt Spring Island. I have collected plants, fruit trees, berry bushes for a couple of years, exciting, and will start to plant them this spring when the deer fence is installed, woohoo! This is perfect for you, Ansa, because that looks like a big <coughs> forest indeed. You will have to be the mute person. Me? Oh, okay. You mean only one of us can be mute? Where are you? No, you can talk, Dad. Dave, you can talk. Oh, you have the cough? <laughs> what? No. To mute somebody else. Oh, oh, okay. You can you can send me like private messages. Oh, you did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yes. These are messages that Dave is just sending me. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I will do that. Um, I guess I can move the host to you. I'll do it. I'll I'll change. I'll make you the host so that you can have the ability to do that. All right, so welcome again. <laughs> I'm gonna play some music now from our favorite permaculture artist. Um, his name is Charlie McGee. Hope you can hear that. So Ansa, And so, what's the weather like right now in British Columbia? If you can tell us. We are, we are in Northern Virginia, which is right now coming out of the 20s. Hopefully, we'll be warmer weather from now on, but we know that there's still February, but it's wonderful that you have your own garden. Rain and plus 11C. Oh my gosh, that sounds really terribly cold. Let's see who else is here. Find a participant. So. That's Celsius, not Fahrenheit, right? So it's yes. not. Oh, it is? Oh, sorry. <laughs> You know what? That's a funny thing is I'm from Celsius, but I've forgotten it already. So I can't even translate what Celsius and Fahrenheit are, but I grew up on Celsius. It's like my mom. She grew up <laughs> speaking Afrikaans. Yeah. She can't speak it. Anymore. I know. That's right. So in the 30s, 30 C, I know that was super hot in the Philippines when we got into the 30 C. So Dave, you can bring in participants, right? Yeah, I've, I said that. Oh, it's warm. In British Columbia, it's warm. Whoa, climate change for real, huh? 
I've collected plants, fruit trees, berry bushes for a couple of years and start to plant them this year. That's wonderful. Great. Yeah. So our backyard is um, a very squished <laughs> food forest. Our trees are all against the wall. But we have one, two. How many trees do we have, Dave? Are you counting the ones in the front or the back? Just the, the back. back. Oh, yeah. We have none. Oh, in the front. Yeah, we do have in the front. <laughs> um one two, so we got two plums a cherry two pears two pawpaws that's it in the back yeah so eight Let's see if i have any pictures but yeah here i can share melissa's here Yay, Melissa, I'm going to, so you can unmute her. Welcome. Well, hey, guys. Hi. Hey. We hear you loud and clear, okay. and everyone's here to greet you. Yep. We are, they're kind of a shy crowd. <laughs> feel, free to, feel free to type in the chat box if you, you can certainly unmute yourselves, but feel free to type in the chat box if you, you know, tell us where you're growing from, what you're growing this season and why you're here because melissa is here melissa tell us a little bit about your since we're you ha we have you on here and a few minutes early about or is this part of your presentation what where you're from and how you got into this food forest sure. yeah i can do that should i share my screen and go ahead and yeah. do that or? yes okay. please do so we can see your lovely face you see me yeah <laughs> <laughs> I've got a virtual background to hide my, my bet. <laughs> we love it. Uh, so let's see here. I um, have a background in psychology. I went to school for that. Um, but my great grandma was a farmer. And so I did grow up getting to visit her farm. Um, and I definitely was inspired by um, all the the lifestyle that I observed there. I kind of grew up mostly in suburbs in the city and her farm was a hundred acres in Illinois. And so it was really a magical place for me to visit. And so I think that kind of planted the seeds in my mind for um, wanting to become a farmer and a gardener someday. And then um, as I, as I, you know, became an adult, I took an interest in gardening and plants and someone gave me a house plant um, that kind of started my obsession with plants as an adult and I filled up my house and then I moved outdoors and now I have a, a little food forest in Portland and a little farming business so I always tell people gardening is habit forming and watch out because you might end up with a farm someday. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's not too little it's about a, a little under an, a little over half an acre right? That's right. Yeah, it's 0.68 acres. So uh, it's a good size. It's a good size. It's probably what a lot of us have here. But um, yeah, so we have the only one who told us, like, feel free, guys, everybody who's here on, you're here. Um, we're here to meet and greet you. So tell us where you're growing from. We have Ansa, who is from British Columbia. And she said she's collected plants, fruit trees, and berry bushes for a couple of years. We've had a few questions come in, and um, Melissa has answered some of them. Okay, yeah, and then we I, have a few. Hmm? Oh, I was just going to say, I tried to, the, the questions that came in through email, I did um, yeah. do my best to answer all of those ahead of time. So, That's and hopefully right. the presentation will answer some more questions as well. That's true. Well, I'm going to catch some, some of the people who've um, lost their links. Okay. So we have 231 registered. Exciting. We have had, we have had one um, time that we had, there was a lockout. Like there were so many registrants that they couldn't get into the room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if tonight will be the same case. Let's see. Hopefully not. All right, there it is. Okay. So yeah, we have five 
more minutes. And um, Melissa, when you first started your food forest, did you um, draw out the concept first and and like how long did that process take? It's a good question. So uh, that process took maybe a week or two, um, depending, but that can take a longer depending on how much time you're putting into this kind of site specific, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we were planning out share at food forest, um, we space everything 16 feet apart in terms of key species. And then we came in and filled in guilds underneath those key species, which are primarily um, apples, pears, and plums at the, at the share at food forest. And so we were working with those types of guilds. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Two weeks. And I guess like uh, observing it a lot, like going outside and, and like walking for hours and hours or how, how, how would you say like the trick would be to like, well, hold. I wouldn't recommend doing it that quickly. Um, we were under a, a different situation because we moved perennials from a different site to this current site. Wow. And we didn't have a lot of time because it was fall and it was time to, it was the ideal time to transplant. Mm -hmm. Recognizing a few names and faces. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we were in a bit of a time crunch with that particular design. Um, and so, uh, you know, the first principle of permaculture design, a lot of people would probably know is um, observation. So in an ideal setting, you would have maybe a whole year to observe the site before you go in and make um, long-term changes. Um, but a lot of times that's not really a luxury most of us have if we're working with, with land. So, um, we, and we did not have that time frame available to us due to the situation of having to transplant things. And so a lot of the site got designed pretty quickly. Um, but we, we didn't know we had the site until, um, November of 2016 and that's when planting began and oh. so um, we were eyeballing the site and competing for that piece of land through a grant process for the uh, prior six months and so we did have the ability to look at the land and observe it during that time so I would say that we started with ideas for the design six months prior to planting um, Wow I think the other interesting thing about your properties that when we visited there were black walnut trees and you started with those but you didn't tear them out yes <laughs> the, there's established um uh black walnuts probably about 100 years old all along wow. the north side of the property but luckily they were not on the south side of the property so they weren't really creating any issues with shade um but in terms of shading out the rest of our plants um, and we I kind of found it to be kind of an interesting challenge there are a lot of um, published lists kind of there I think there's one um, that I found in Guy's Garden even um, that has some uh, gills that will work okay with black walnut and one thing in particular that's considered a buffer is like a mulberry plant and mm -hmm. so we did plant mulberries along the back side of the food forest to kind of create a buffer zone for the walnuts along with Jerusalem artichoke. We have a whole row of those along the back. And so there are plants that are known to tolerate um, the presence of black walnut. And um, so we just kind of went with it. That's great. Wow. Well, we're just, we're pretty much ready to start. We have one more minute. There's amazing. Um, you can check the chat box, Melissa, if you want to for, uh, somebody who's coming in from Florida and really serious about reforesting deforested land in Brazil. That's cool. so inspiring. So yes, yeah, so you can start it. We're right on top, top of the hour. Um, All right. We're ready. You, you take it away. Let me just introduce you really quickly here. Tonight we have with us Melissa Manuel. Oops. I'm just going to find your title. And she is the one of the farmers and co-founder of the Sherritt Food Forest, an urban food forest in Portland, Oregon. She has a degree in psychology and was certified as a permaculture design consultant under Toby Hemingway. 
Melissa has over a decade experience creating edible landscapes, utilizing plant guilds and permaculture design principles. Welcome, Melissa. We're so happy to have you. Take it away. Thank you for having me. I'm kind of trying to still figure out how to share my screen here because <laughs> this is my first time doing a webinar. So everyone bear with me because I'm a total newbie here. You're doing great. Oh, can you see the presentation? Not yet. So I can see the presentation, but I can't see you guys. So can you see me? Yeah, we can see you, but we don't see the presentation. How do I? Are you on full screen or are you on? Uh... Or Zoom. So have you clicked the share button to select? Uh, you can pick which programs you're sharing. Okay. There. So. Okay. There we go. Yep, we, we see, see it. it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> everyone can see everyone's good to go. Yes. Okay, well, welcome everybody and thank you for attending the webinar tonight. And a big thanks to Permaculture Gardens, our hosts. Um, uh, they do some really great work helping suburban families grow their own food and uh, with a permaculture focus. And I really encourage you to check out their website. Um, they have a lot of cool gardening resources on there and neat articles and um, doing some awesome work. So thanks, guys, for hosting this tonight. And um, so I've been growing food for us here in the Pacific Northwest for a little bit here. And the beginning photo here on this first slide shows a food forest um, plant guild compli comprised of plum, apricot, honeyberry, cardoon, bee balm, lovage, nasturtium, calendula, and thyme, and with a Great Dane for scale there. And let's see. So let's get started here. Plant guilds are the building blocks of an ecosystem. I really like that quote by Toby Hemingway. And, um, you know, I like to think of plant guilds as kind of a group of plants or family of plants or friends uh, that work together and have a synergistic effect, each plant benefiting the whole. And in this presentation, I'm going to go over the benefits of planting in polyculture plant guilds with an introductory explanation of food forestry and the basics of plant guilds for those of you who might be new to the topics. And then we'll take a closer look at structure, function, and the how-to of establishing plant guilds. And just a little disclaimer, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I live in Portland. Most of my experience with uh, food forestry happens here. And so I will be focusing on temperate food forestry but if you are in a warmer climate watching this, um, just know that you can do this too. And there are so many resources on the internet that I hope you can find some topics that will work for you in the tropics. <laughs> All right. So let's get started by taking a look at why it's beneficial to grow plant guilds. In the current way that we're growing food in, in conventional agriculture, it relies upon the removal and devastation of an ecosystem in order to grow a monoculture of one species. Um, and this photo shows um, how the um, rainforest in Indonesia are being removed um, for the production of palm oil. And some people are probably familiar with how devastating that has been to orangutans and other animals and the whole ecosystem. Um, monoculture methods are shown to eventually lead to desertification of the land as well um, as creating pollution. And um, do, 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 here we see another photo of what's happening in the Amazon right now to produce industrial crops. Um, and these kind of productions are also using a lot of inputs of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides that all have to go somewhere when they're being done, when they're being, when the cycle is completed, uh, the soil is almost dead because they've taken away all, all the, the plants. And so there's nothing to really hold any nutrients in that soil anymore. Everything 
starts to run off into the watershed. And so we have a lot of issues all over the world right now with, um, you know, algae blooms and things like that um, because of all these synthetic um, fertilizers going into our water streams. Um, and one just little quick note on the Amazon, um, a lot of uh, Western science is finally recognizing that the Amazon and other rainforests and places of biodiversity were um, and are managed and by indigenous people. Um, they were not just wild happenstance ecosystems that just so happened to have all this biodiversity and useful plants for humans. They were actually and still are cultivated intentionally by sophisticated complex methods and would be called a food forest in some, in some way, I would say. And so it is pretty devastating to see that these forest ecosystems being completely taken away in order to grow um, stuff so that we can have our snacks. So let's um, talk about another way of growing food in polycultures, which um, in this presentation, I'll talk about polycultures as being synonymous with the term plant guild. Um, if you hear a dog, my dog is present. Um, <laughs> just a little side note. Uh, so polycultures are the practice of growing multiple species in order to create an ecosystem. It's the opposite of a polyculture. Um, so we're growing multiple crops together and they all are going to benefit each other in some way or another. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So food forests are living proof that industrial agriculture is not the only way to feed the world. They are comprised of intentional patterns of plant guilds replicated across the landscape and designed to mimic the architecture of a woodland ecosystem. Food forestry is regenerative, resilient, and time-tested. And um, not only are we growing food, but we're cultivating humanity. You know, it has cultural effects of the way that we grow food has implications that ripple out all across our culture. Um, and this slide, I really enjoy this slide. Um, Molly Danielson made this, I believe associated with Beacon Food Force up in Seattle, but it's a great example of, um, this is a plum guild, a plum tree, and all the different ecosystem services that are happening surrounding a uh, plum tree. And uh, so when we think about a food forest, um, if, 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 uh, if plant guilds are the building blocks of a food forest, um, the food forest is basically just a, a, a replicated pattern of guilds all um, working together to create a larger um, super plant guild, so to speak. And with each plant um, supporting the whole in one way or another and having the function. So, do 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 do. So we have uh, the seven F's of food forests. Um, you guys may have heard this before. Food, fuel, fiber, fodder, fertilizer, pharmaceutics, and fun. Um, so when we are planting out a food forest and looking to fill the, the guild with different useful plants, the plants might produce any one of these things in a food forest. Food or fuel such as, you know, um, maybe you want hazelnuts so you can make hazelnut oil um, and you might want to grow some um, some firewood and so you're coppicing something you can make you know you can be doing fiber uh, crops you can be growing some fodder for your animals um, producing uh, fertilizer uh, medicine of course and then hopefully you're deriving a lot of you know joy gaining joy from this process as well um, and so all of that's happening with the power of plant guilds. And so we're going to just move into what is a plant guild more specifically. So here we have um, an example that a lot of you might be familiar with, um, Three Sisters Guild um, of corn, squash, and beans. So the plants work together, the corn providing a trellis for the beans, the beans acting as a nitrogen fixer, and the squash acting as a ground cover shading the ground and conserving soil moisture. And this is a good example of a simple guild comprised of vegetables. So even if you don't have a food forest system, you can design your veggie plots with companion planting in mind. 
Uh, this one added in a, a sunflower as well, which are actually allopathic like uh, walnuts. So watch out for that. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's see. So you can do this kind of um, simple guild with just a few plants. Um, and then on the other side here, we see an, an orchard guild, which is kind of an example of intercropping, a form of agroforestry, where annual crops are grown in the alleyways of the orchard, um, such as you can see here with four crops shown growing together with the apple tree. We've got runner beans, strawberries, and spinach. <clears throat> and so this is kind of moving towards the direction of what a food forest guild would be. Um, but still a little more simple and short term. And so once we start talking about food forestry, the guilds can become even more complex as food forest plant guilds do tend to have more elements and typically with seven or more plants per guild making up the layers of the food forest. So when we get ready to design a food forest plant guild, we're gonna be focusing on structure, um, finding plants that fit into the architecture of a food forest, which mimics the layers of a woodland ecosystem. And many of those plants happen to be perennial plants that live multiple years, such as fruit and nut trees, berry bushes and herbs. And there can be a lot of annual plants in a food forest system with root veggies, greens and edible flowers reseeding themselves every year. Uh, this diagram here shows a common pattern of arranging the layers of a food forest, especially in a temperate climate where you want to make a sun trap of sorts with the taller species um, being towards the north and uh, the plants that need more sun um, being towards the south and forming kind of like a slope upwards. And so this is going on in the food forest that I work with at Sherrick for Food Forest as well. And on the north, we have very tall black walnuts sloping all the way down towards our pathways where we have you know, ground covers like thyme and, um, and strawberries and things that kind of would be growing lower to the ground. And so you can um, structure your food forest like this. Um, and these are all some examples of plants that can go into those different um, layers of the food forest. And I, uh, let's see here. So when we're considering the function of the plants with the guild, oops, I'm sorry, I kind of skipped ahead here. Again, thanks for bearing with me. Such a new newbie here to these webinars. And so I'm gonna go ahead and go forward here. So then we're gonna talk about the function. So if we are looking at the structure of a food forest and we wanna mimic those layers, we also want to consider the function of the plants in the guild. So what, what role is each plant playing in the guild? And what about the yields? And so um, these are the, kind of the main functions that we're looking at in a plant guild for a food forest. Suppressors, accumulators, mulchers, fixers, attractors, and repellers. Um, so suppressors are things that prevent weeds and grass growth. They kind of fill that ecological niche of grass. And so clover is one of my favorite ones to use. Um, it really outcompetes grass pretty well. Oregano, chives, leek, garlic, thyme, columbine, um, anything that's going to kind of um, suppress those other weeds and take, the, take over that niche. Um, accumulators, um, so some people call those dynamic accumulators. They're plants with deep roots that are going to bring up um, nutrients into their leaves and then when they die a lot of them are um, are going to die back in the um, winter and the leaves will then distribute those nutrients on the ground to be available for the other plants. Um, mulchers can um, and again to just uh, some of these plants can fit into multiple categories which is also awesome we like to stack functions so to speak. Um, mulchers are going to be things you can be using for green manure um, chopping and dropping. Uh, fixers are things that fix nitrogen and so those are going to be the plants that are bringing some fertility into the soil. Um, when you chop them back the root nodules are collecting nitrogen and they will die back and release that nitrogen into the soil and making it um, bioavailable to the other plants nearby. 
Um, repellers are things that are going to be useful in repelling pests um, or use, e even being used as like a trap crop. Um, nasturtium is one of those trap crops. They, um, they, are, they draw um, aphids. And so if you, if you don't want aphids on your brassicas, you can plant nasturtiums nearby and they'll probably go for the nasturtiums first. Um, marigolds, alyssum, daffodil, coriander daisies, basil chives. Um, attractors are gonna be things that are attracting pollinators. Um, so really almost any flower can work. Um, so um, you can look up bloom calendars um, in your region and see if you can find stuff that um, you can put into your garden that will provide something in bloom year round. I really like um, Portland Nursery has a really excellent bloom calendar and uh, you can check that out. They have some great resources if you're in the Pacific Northwest or a temperate region. Um, a lot of their, their resources will be useful. Again, that's uh, Portland Nurseries. Um, they have a lot of brochures. You can check them out. Uh, so, do, 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 do. so some of my favorite nitrogen fixtures too. Um, white clover and crimson clover are really awesome for the ground covers and. Um, you can use things in the Eleagnus family, which uh, silverberry, seaberry, gummyberry, false indigo is another nitrogen fixer, lupin. Um, you can even use like a big key species, like a mimosa is, is a, a tree that fixes nitrogen. And you can use a lot of things for mulching. Like if you have weed pressure in your food forest while you're establishing it, um, don't be discouraged because you are being given a lot of green manure to use. <laughs> so you can be using some of those things as a chop and drop in the meantime while you're kind of waiting for the succession to move along. And um, some of those weeds will disappear when, when um, the system becomes more mature. So let's take a look at an example of um, how some of these plants can work together. This method is called push and pull. Um, so the intercrop desmodium is a leguminous plant that fixes nitrogen and also has chemicals that repel the corn borer moths, um, while the napier grass in turn attracts the moths to lay eggs there instead of on the corn. So in addition, the grass can be chopped and dropped and used as a green manure. So right in this diagram, we're seeing three functions happening to support this maze, the nitrogen fixing, repelling, and mulching. So this is an example of how we can be growing some annual crops, but still with the support of a guild. And now let's take a look at um, all of these functions pulled together into a food forest guild. So here we have a peach. Um, I'll chime in just because there were two questions that came in because your slides sure. are so precious. Um, someone was asking if they could get a copy of your slides emailed to, and another one was if you had a book that you could recommend. Um, is there a book we can buy with all this info, or this is your experience? Sure. Um, so um, at the very end of the presentation, I do have a food for thought slide with some book recommendations, and I'll, I'll elaborate on some more books then. Um, and in terms of getting copies of the slides, I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, if you want to shoot me an email at shareitfoodforest um, at gmail.com, I can send and share things with you there. And I do believe that this is going to be um, recorded and posted on YouTube. Is that correct? Yes, yeah? this, will, okay. this will be recorded. So, um, for those of you who want to go back, I know some of these slides have a lot of information on them that I'm not really, you know, I should have maybe leave them up a little longer. Um, so you can go and, and check out that video when um, Nikki posts it later and, and pause to your heart's delight on any slide you like. <laughs> um, any other questions so far that I can answer? No? Okay. So here we have... Um, both function and structure combined into a food forest plant guild. So here is a peach tree guild. Um, 
We have chicory as the dynamic accumulator, um, cosmos as an attractor, uh, red clover as fixing nitrogen, comfrey is, um, is also a dynamic accumulator, but is being used as a mulcher in this case. We have strawberries acting as a suppressor, arguably not the best suppressor, but still great ground cover once you can get it established. Um, garlic as a repeller. And so this is um, one example. And also just to say here, um, some questions I get are very site specific and grower specific. People will say, well, what should I do at my site, this or that? And then a lot of my answers are, it depends because it really is so site specific and grower specific. There's no right way or wrong way to make a food forest or a, or a plant guild. Uh, plants are pretty resilient and they do pretty well almost, you know, you, you, you shouldn't be afraid to try new things. It shouldn't be afraid to give it a shot because they're going to do really good. Um, and even if you don't get it quote perfect, um, you know, my, my food forest is a good example of that we have black walnut looming over the whole site and everything's doing pretty well. Um, I think the annual gardens that were grown there in the past did struggle a little bit, but with the different um, resilient factors of a food forest um, and all the different um, perennial plants, they, they do pretty well. So don't think that you have to do it one specific way. Like I have to use Cosmos as my attractor, it said so. No, 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 like play around with it. Like what kind of flowers do you like? Maybe you wanna put some dahlias in there or something. So don't, don't get rigid with your thinking and it's kind of a holistic way of thinking as, as um, food forestry and plant guilds. So here's another example of a plum tree guild. So in this one we have nasturtium acting as a coddling moth deterrent, uh, comfrey living mulch and a dynamic accumulator, garlic again repelling pests and acting kind of like as a natural fungicide, marigold deterring pests and encouraging growth, clover acting as a ground cover attracting pollinators, nitrogen fixer, having a couple functions there. Lemon balm, aromatic, beneficial insect attractor, and chives as a, another pest repellent, and as an apple scab disease prevention. So a lot of what I do when I'm thinking about plant guilds, I Google a lot of things. Like I, I will Google, you know, the pests of a particular plant. Like I, if I'm doing a plum tree, I'll, I'll look it all up. I don't necessarily have everything memorized. Some stuff starts to stick after a while but I'll look up like what are the pest problems in my area for this plant or that plant and what are the things that repel it or what draws the beneficial insects that I need to eat the pests. And so um, again, going back to things being very site specific, you want to, you, you might have a different scenario from one place to another and you might want to have a dis different scenario from one grower to another because maybe you don't like plums. You don't want to have a plum tree build. You want to have a peach tree guild. So um, now I'm kind of moving into um, talking about how to establish a food forest with succession in mind. So we can go out and plant our food forest guild, but realistically, we have to wait a few years for those perennial species to produce. So why not plan for a yield of annual crops in the meantime while the perennials are getting established? Um, so this is a photo of some beds that um, we laid out on contour. This is a food forest in Boren, Oregon, probably about 2014. Um, this bed shows how we came in and, and sheet mulched and um, established the beds by bringing in some additional compost and soil from around the site. And we wood chipped the path. And you can see some key species. And um, so the long-term stuff is planted with these stakes, you can barely see anything right now in this photo. Um, it's uh, trees with nitrogen fixers in between. And then in between that, we have some berry bushes, there's some currants and a couple other long-term things put in. But as you can see, wow, there is a lot of space here. So um, what are we gonna do with all this space? At this time, we were operating a CSA. So we wanted to yield some vegetables from the site as we were establishing a long-term food forest. So we did that, and these are the same beds, um, same um, angle, just a little slightly closer, and you 
you can see here still these key species and nitrogen fixtures alternating along the, the bed. Um, and there's some longer term things in here. So this is almost kind of like an example of intercropping to some extent. But when you look at the whole system long term, it's going to be a lot more wiggly than an intercrop system. It's not going to just be straight rows of alley crops or in an orchard. Um, because we are planting on contour. And so it's kind of a way of organizing the systems as they're being established and still being able to obtain a yield. We planted rows of vegetables in these um, systems, but they are still polyculture. So we have a lot of greens, um, brassicas. This is an annual uh, German chamomile. We've got um, some um, herbs in here. I think that's some licorice mint, things like that. Um, so that we can gain a yield while the long-term stuff is taking its time becoming established. Um, so then um, we can see uh, another angle of the site from the other direction, just a little bit of a, a close-up of what we've got going on in here. Um, brassicas, salad greens, um, licorice mint, some garlic and alliums here, um, chamomile and all that. So. So with each key species having its support species and the annuals that are companion planted also act as a support species to the guild as it's being established. And it gets you nearby your food forest plant guild. If you just planted it with the perennials and walked away, you might not be around to tend to the, to the site as much. Um, it, it makes sense to keep it in production the entire succession all the way through as the, as the food forest is becoming established. And a lot of the methods that we use are sheet mulching methods when we're coming in to establish a site, which does not lend well to direct sowing. Um, so what we would do is, you know, this is um, that uh, same area. Um, and after it had been straw mulch and sheet mulch, you can kind of see some of the sheet mulching in this area. We would come back and dig through the cardboard and all the, and the mulching layers and put in um, plant starts. And so we've found a lot of success with, um, growing the plants out to a certain stage of hardiness before putting them into the fruit forest system. It allows for us to do, um, to do this sort of thing with annuals versus if we were just direct sowing, it, it doesn't tend to work as well in terms of actually gaining a production uh, rate of yields. Um, do, do, do. So then we'll go into, I've got a little before and after here of our um, food forest at Share Food Forest. And you can see here that this is when we established the site, December 2016. There was um, a lot of room in the system. And we did come in and put in a lot of annuals in here that first couple years. And we still are doing that when we establish new areas of the food forest, putting in a lot of annuals for our customers and um, that's where our CSA crops would come from primarily, but we also do have some market garden rows that are polyculture planted. And so um, you can see the before and now this is, this was taken this last year in June. Um, same site, um, this is an almond tree. This is that same almond tree. And you can see kind of some of the herbs starting to grow along the path and they arch up. You can see the walnut trees in the background. It creates like a, an arch all along, um, the pathway going up from the path outward. And the entire site creates a sun slope up to the walnuts in the back. Um, right now, this angle that we're looking at is from the south. We're kind of standing in the southwest corner looking east, northeast. Um, and so all the plants are kind of planned out that way with some of the shorter stuff being on the south all the way up to the walnuts in the back. And, you can see kind of some of the herbs here, got some sage along the path and lots of thymes. I love putting thyme along the pathways um, and some um, berry bushes here. Got some cardoons. I love cardoons for a mulch plant. They're a great um, early succession plant to have in the food forest as it's becoming established. And that brings us to our last slide. Um, so I've got a little food for thought here, some recommended reading. Um, I love Gaia's Garden. That's what introduced me to the concept of food forestry when I was a houseplant hoarder. I was hoarding my houseplants. I knew I needed to spill out into my yard somewhere. And as I started gardening the way that my grandmas had taught me, 
and I started looking over books in the garden section at Powell's, um, uh, not the downtown Powell's, but there's, you know, the, the two, gar there's the garden Powell's and the little Powell's right on Hawthorne, very fun little spots. Um, so I found Gaia's garden and started flipping through it and bought it and was my, you know, it changed my life. I was able to go and take a course with Toby Hemingway and become certified as a permaculture designer in 2013. So um, a lot of my permaculture perspective is informed by Toby Hemingway. Um, so definitely all time favorite permaculture book right there. Um, Carrots Love Tomatoes is a, one of my favorite companion planting books. Um, the author also has a book called Roses Love Garlic. Um, both of them are just excellent little manuals. They're written as like a list style by alphabet. They're alphabetized and they just show like little lists of who the, who your friends are, who your foes are. Super useful, super user friendly. Um, and I love the, I love that one. Uh, Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie. Um, that's an iconic textbook level, um, book, um, with two, uh, there's, Forest Gardens 1 and Forest Gardens 2, two volumes, very dense um, books with lots of information in there about forest gardening and food forests and polyculture. And, um, recommend checking that book out as well. And um, just keep digging around there on the internet too. I mean, I'm always learning new things. Um, there's kind of an explosion going on with food forestry right now, I think, and a lot of people are taking note and publishing content and sharing ideas. And this is a really awesome time to be, um, to be a forest gardener. And so with that, I will conclude the presentation and um, open it up for some more questions if anyone has some. Wow, thank you so much, Melissa. That was totally, I learned, I learned a few things too. I was taking notes of all these things. I, I didn't know even though you take a permaculture design course, there's still some things, you know, that you go through it again and again, just like that, the system of permaculture with each iteration of learning these, you learn something new all the time. And I think I'm just, I'm just floored. Thank you so much, Melissa, for, well, for me, I just learned, like, I didn't know the sun slope concept. Did you know that, Dave? <laughs> Maybe I haven't just been reading the books very carefully. Maybe. You can unmute yourself, right? Yeah, I can unmute myself. Yeah, but I didn't realize that. That was that's pretty cool. I um, that that's then that makes sense. It's like I th I think what happens in a PDC it's it's like seventy two hours. Normally they they compact everything into one week, and it's such an intense week. They just bombard you with information, and it's great because you get to see all the possibilities. Of, of what you could do with permaculture, but then it's nice to then slowly circle back and, and uh, revisit these things because it reinforces the information that you received during that first uh, bombardment. Yeah, uh, one of the permaculture phrases that I like is patterns from patterns to detail. And so I think of a, of a PDC as being a place where you learn the patterns and it's almost, you know, when I took my PDC, people would ask very specific questions like, well, where do I plant my carrots? And the answer to that question is, it depends. <laughs> the answer to every gardening question is, it depends. It's always going to be a slightly different solution that you arrive at based on who you are as a grower, what your needs are, what the site is, and what the site's needs are. And so a permaculture course is laying out the pattern and like the philosophy of thinking about things and the details are um, what you are going to be facing when you design your own system. Um, so it, sometimes when people ask me very site specific questions, I can't give the answer, even though I've been doing food forestry for a number of years now and I have my own food forest. Um, I can't necessarily give you the, exact answer that you might need for your site um what i want to do is is tell you that you're empowered to do this yourself and with your community or your partners or whoever um, you can arrive at those solutions with this pattern of thinking um, thinking about function structure um, in your inputs and your outputs and 
Um, and thinking about, you know, when you think about the structure of, of your garden, making, thinking about the long-term pattern of it, like what, what are the plants going to look like when they're in full maturity and how are you going to accommodate for that? And the sun slope is in, is in relation to that. So you, you don't want to plant things in a way that's going to harm something down the road because of too much shade or too much sun. Wow. Well, do you mind if I, um, I'm just going to go question by question here and you'll just try to answer them. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> <I'll do my laughs> so <best>. questions. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to find the first one that we didn't answer, which is, is the distance to scale those plants look really close together? Do they compete with each other or just help? Sure. Are you thinking of, are we thinking about maybe one of the slides where, um, there was, um, annuals planted in with the perennials, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, it, it, that the spacing is also kind of subjective. Um, I got a question earlier from someone asking about a method of doing backyard orcharding where it was recommended to plant trees two feet apart. Um, I would not do that personally, but it also totally depends on the site. Like so if, if you are doing an espalier planting, um, which is basically like um, you guys may have seen uh, a fence with plants that with like a fruit tree that is espalier to be super space efficient along the edge of, of the fence. Um, I wish I had an image to show you guys because I'm not great at explaining what that is, but um, that in that case, you would probably plant things closer together, even though they're long-term fruit trees, because you're going to be pruning them very heavily and very specifically for that purpose. And so it, it is kind of about what your intentions are and what your site is like. Um, for us, when we were, the pictures I showed of those gardens were my polyculture gardens for our CSA production. And so we were kind of thinking in line of like, when are we going to harvest these annuals? And when those come out, there'll be more room for the perennials that are starting to take over. Um, so thinking in terms of time, is another important thing. I didn't go over too much in this um, presentation, but structure, um, function, and time are really some of the three are the three main things you're going to be considering. So, whereas you know, it might be too close in for now, but if something is coming out of the system because it's an annual, it won't impede upon the growth of the perennials nearby, and um, so it is kind of a, a balancing act. Um, but you do want to make sure you have enough room for air circulation with your plants. And I've definitely made that mistake in the past of planting things a little too close because I got too excited <laughs> about polycultures and putting everything in together. So it doesn't hurt to err on the side of giving a little extra space um, because it won't, it, it will hurt if you don't give enough space, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. And someone was asking about mint, like you were, okay having a lot of mint you weren't scared of the mint going everywhere and stifling growth of other yeah i get that a lot we have mint in our food forest and um it is a great suppressor it really outcompetes the grass and so you can you can put it in a bed um and just keep an eye on it i mean i think that it depends on um what you don't have to put mint in your system if it if it really disturbs you the idea that it would take it take over um then by all means don't put it in a pot instead um that's perfectly reasonable but um at the same time you know for us because we're production farmers we're selling to our csa customers and at the farmer's market or to restaurants um if we have a bed of mint it's an orange mint or a chocolate mint or or peppermint like they are a crop that is valuable to us it's a yield that we can use to make added value products or we can use it raw to sell to restaurants or whatnot and um, it fills a niche and so in the food forest context you're looking for plants to fill an ecological niche if you don't have something to outcompete the grass you'll have grass it's okay to have grass but you might want something more useful so true um, a lot of people are from the Portland area here. Shout out to Kelly, who says, I'm trying to do this in the Portland area, and this is incredibly helpful. Quinn says, I'm trying to do this in Portland, too. Thank you so much for the info. Um, 
and then I'm south of Turner at 400 feet elevation on former horse property, which means the soil is quite compacted, but we have four plus acres with so lots of area to work with. Uh, what is a pick? I don't understand that part. I think she said PDC. She oh, a PDC. Okay, oh. Valerie. Um, Valerie, a PDC is a permaculture. We have people, who, um, like we talked about succession, and I was afraid that some people who might, this might be their first, um, you know, webinar with, uh, with us coming from not, not, not growing much or, or not learning, uh, not knowing much about permaculture. A PDC is a permaculture design course. And that's what Melissa, David, and I, and maybe some of you here are already certified in. And um, yeah, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, so, um, well, thanks for the shout out, Portlanders. Um, I'm also trying to do this in Portland, so I appreciate learning from you guys too. So come to one of my tours at the Food Forest this spring and summer, and we'll, if we haven't connected already, we can connect there and talk gardening. I recognize some of my CSA customers in the, <laughs> in the chat tonight. So thank you to you guys for being such awesome supporters of us. And, and um, you know, a lot of what we're doing is experimental in terms of, their, of um, trying to create a, a yield that can be brought to market. Um, so we do appreciate the support that our community gives us and, um, and doing this kind of experimental agriculture project. And Melissa, your email is share at foodforest at gmail.com. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Double R, double T. That's right. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the chat box so you guys can make sure to touch base with her. Yeah. Um, let me see who else. Uh, there's so many questions coming in. I'm sorry, Dave, can you, <laughs> if you can <laughs> catch some of them for me, I don't want to miss anyone. Um, so, oh, in general, keep lemon balm in container. Saw a picture with it in the container. We have it loose where chickens are now. It's arriving where other not or did not. Do you have any experience planting fruit trees into Google culture beds? Is it possible? Logistically, sure. I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, why not? I mean, I think that one thing that you want to keep in mind with a um, Google culture is that sometimes you depending on how thick the layers are. So Hugel culture, for those of you who may not know what that is, it's basically burying logs and other woody debris um, and to create like a hill of some kind um, or a berm, like a berm with can be a Hugel culture as well. And one of the only issues I see with planting a fruit tree directly into a fresh Hugel culture is that there may not be enough soil available for that fruit tree to be happy, it might be running into a lot of woody debris. So I would probably recommend doing some annuals and things that will help break that down first and then putting your fruit tree in the second or third year. I think that's one of the things people see these videos for Google cultures and then they just go get their dead wood and then and put it in a big pile and then they're like, okay, let's, let's have some abundance. So uh, I think what people forget to do with their hugel cultures is you, you need to have quite a thick layer of soil uh, on top of that hugel culture just to encourage the breaking down because otherwise the dead wood can become a nitrogen sink. Mm -hmm. And then for the, the first few years, that's good. it's going to be uh, difficult to, to get a lot of production out of that. So you really want to encourage that to break down as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I love it. People are starting to connect on the chat. Like, <laughs> like Travis has a food forest group in PDX. What is PDX? <laughs> oh, PDX is an abbreviation for Portland. Yeah, oh. it's the PDX. It came from the abbreviation for the Portland Airport, and oh. so a lot of Portlanders refer to Portland as PDX. <laughs> there we go. So. I'm entering year two, he says. And then Alec Rose is recently moved to 28 acres in Che. Chihala Mountain, southwest of Portland. Super excited to design our food forest and other permaculture plant gardening. Okay. Cool. cool. So many people here. It's like, now you guys are, no wonder you were shy. You were permies. <laughs> <laughs> I like the question for food Lisa. Food forest the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last year, I planted about 500 plum pits along trails, roads, campsites, parking areas to feed the future. Yes, David. 
Joshua Stacy. I'm in the Portland area as well. Been grafting, collecting fruit trees for a couple of years now, and now it's time to start planting. Valley Button, thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Great illustrations. Love your style. I'm also in Portland, Mar Maria says, and I'm thinking of converting my garden into an urban food forest. Could we ask practical questions, Sienna? <laughs> yeah, Sienna so asks regarding making the beds. Since they're on yeah. contour, does she employ the berm and swale method? Yes, um, and the picture, uh, I can go back and kind of show that slide. Um, you can kind of see, maybe you can almost see here. So you can kind of see we're on a, this is a 25 degree slope. <laughs> it was a challenging site to work with, um, but it actually was the first food forest that I, um, that I designed and planted out. Um, so it was a great learning opportunity. Um, we did kind of, so when you're, when we're creating these berms here on contour, um, it kind of automatically creates a swale of sorts because um, we were building up the contour lines. And so when it did rain, it would uh, definitely pool in the pathways. Um, so this is definitely uh, an intention that we had in, in mind when we designed it. Um, and the, the site, it's, the whole site was designed this way so that as you can kind of see here too, as the water would kind of pool here, there's a place for it to spill down and into this next swale and so on and so forth. And at the very bottom below these beds was a pond. And so we were trying to kind of root water down there um, and build the beds up so as not to have any huge issues with runoff. And so um, we would oftentimes, uh, we did a lot of sheet mulching in this site. Like we sheet mulched like two acres of food forest. And then, uh, then we kind of softened our approach a little bit and started using a tiller to establish food forest sites, which I was completely opposed to ideologically. Um, but then I started realizing like, if you are only one person and you're doing all this manual labor, you're gonna F yourself up. Um, and so you're gonna be slowing yourself down. So it's okay to use tools to establish a site. Um, I was a really slow one to come around on that, but I am now in the camp of, you can do a final till is what I call it. Let's do the last till so that we can, you know, remove grass. I still recommend sheet mulching after that. So <laughs> if you really want to have some good um, luck suppressing all those weeds and grasses, but um, yeah, great question. So hopefully yeah. that answered it without too much rambling. <laughs> I had a question while you're on this slide. Um, when you're designing the guilds on, and you're primarily planting on a contour system, how do you link the guilds together during your design? That's a great question. So um, uh, one example from my current food forest site on Sherritt Street um, is when I talked about using mulberries as a buffer. Um, so when I, we were designing the, the guild to go under the black walnuts, which actually we still have not established. If anyone visits that food forest today, there's a lot of blackberries underneath the walnuts and just like wood chips and lemon balm and some things kind of wild under there. And it hasn't been established yet as much as the rest of the food forest, but there are things that can be planted under there. Like there's, you know, wood violets are fine under there. Um, there's, uh, and then the mulberries are up against there with the, um, with some Jerusalem artichoke. And so the mulberries are part of what we have um, with an elderberry guild along the back as well. And so you kind of look for overlap. And if you're looking for lists online or like, groupings of plants that work well together. You can like find ones that are in both groups, like, oh, mulberry is, is um, in the black walnut guild and can be a good thing to be in a guild with elderberry. So as I'm kind of merging those groups together, I'm thinking about ways that they can kind of overlap, like a Venn diagram, I guess, um, so that they are creating a, a super guild, uh, which would be the food forest itself. And so, the food forest is a polyculture made up of smaller polycultures. Cool. Cool. Uh, Suzanne Pratt says, great info. I'm working on my PDC with OSU for the one third acre in Milwaukee that we just bought. Looking awesome. to do this. Yeah, co-planting. Um, and Lisa has a question. Half of my backyard is woods and we also have a mature 
but we also have mature walnut trees. My bigger question has to do with the forest animals. How do you control the deer? How do you protect your crops from being eaten by the animals? I think that's a good question for suburban back. I answered a question like that earlier through email too. And um, part of the answer is going to annoy people. Um, when you're creating an ecosystem, that's part of it. There's going to be wildlife drawn to that. And Part of it is acceptance. Part of it is letting go. Part of it is planting more than you're going to need because you're anticipating that some other creature is going to come along and have some of it. And that is okay. Like humans are an apex. We are a critical species in an ecosystem. We're there to move plants around. We're there to garden. We're there to help establish these ecosystems. And so we need to learn to, to not be greedy um, but that being said, that's, that can be really annoying to hear because <laughs> some people are, you know, and myself included, like, well, I want a yield from all this hard work. And um, so, you know, we do have deer fencing at the site in Sherritt Food Forest. Um, and despite that, we've had some deer find their way in through the, through the gates. <laughs> they come over there and they eat things and um, it's like their own little buffet or something. Um, and we do have, um, you know, we have... Uh, small mammals in the food forest that come through too and birds of course and so if you if you notice that there's something that is a particular problem i would put you know fencing around it you can utilize this, those kind of barriers you can use natural fencing like we do have some um, like sea buckthorn or sea berries really a great hedge plant hawthorn can be a good hedge plant using things that are be thorny and like this picture, this worked pretty well. When we got to the site, there was a huge, this is all Himalayan blackberry. This is a huge, huge hedgerow of Himalayan blackberry with some hawthorn in it. And so um, we thought about using our manual labor to remove all this. And then we thought twice because we like to eat blackberries. Um, and also it was providing a really great deer barrier on this side. Um, the deer did not want to come through this huge hedge of prickly thorns. So you don't have to use Himalayan blackberry. This was just already here and we were just kind of accepting it. Um, but you can use other kind of thorny plants to deter the entrance, um, you know, secure your bar your perimeter. Um, you can use netting of course, and, um, and, Beyond that, um, I'm a little hands off, a little bit of a hippie about it. So I might not be the best to answer that question. <laughs> oh, no, there's some um, people wanting to know more about your tours. So I'm also putting in the link to your site and the private tours if anybody wanted to stop by and see your place. Sure. So, and I'll, I'll let you guys know, too, that we do offer private tours to accommodate people who um, – would want to come see this the site in any capacity, but we offer. Um, I'm about to publish our our year long calendar soon, and we do offer once a month free tours. Um, last year they were on Sundays. This year they might be a different day, but um, if you're interested in knowing about opportunities like that, um, just uh, you can shoot me an email, and I'll put you on our newsletter list, or you can go to our website. Um, share at foodforest.org and you can get on our newsletter list there as well. Um, we also offer like we've been starting to do little um, events at the food forest that are um, just donation based free events. Um, we have like a children's story hour weekly um, and a couple other things like that that were are in the works to just get people in the garden more. And we're also planning on doing, um, on creating a, a on-site farm stand with a little third space for people to shop in the neighborhood and, and be able to sit and enjoy the garden. So that's one of our big goals and plans for this, um, upcoming spring 2020. So, um, yeah, awesome. hopefully you guys can come and visit. Um, so a few more questions here. Um, how about berry bushes in a year old, Google bed um, and and a question and I'll do the longer question after these two shorter questions um, okay. lion but how about berry bushes in a year old Google bed and what about wood chips as cough as cover like the back to Eden method does this prevent using ground cover such as strawberries or clover good questions and so Yes, go ahead and put your berry bushes into a one-year established hugel culture as long as it's got a good thick layer of topsoil. Um, and, it, and 
Number two, using wood chips as a mulch on your beds, you just want to make sure that they're not something that is going to um, and alter the pH of your soil. So things that are chips that are from conifers, anything that is like a pine tree, dug fir, cedar, things like that, they're going to um, increase the acid level of your soil. And in the Pacific Northwest, that's something that you want to be really careful about because our soils are already pretty high in acid. Um, and because of all the rain, kind of like leaching nutrients out of the soil. So we, we want to be careful about what kind of wood chips we're going to put on top of our beds. Um, and, but it doesn't necessarily prevent um, establishing um, the ground covers um, because the, the mulches are going to break down. And so it, it does impede them a bit. Like here we have mulch um, with straw, but we do a lot of mulching with the wood chips as well. Um, and we have time kind of creeping along into the wood chip path. There's some clover here and sages and stuff. And so um, it, it may impact and slow the growth down just a tiny bit to be, for those root systems to reach out into the um, and to, you know, especially if it's something that has a shallow root system, like a mint and trying to climb along through the wood chips, it might impede it. But, um, I haven't noticed any real difficulties with using wood chips as a mulch. Okay. And Lion asks, Lion Waxman asks, did you have irrigation drip or otherwise during the early phases? Now you mentioned a market garden. Is that in a separate area than the food forest? Do you use irrigation or contour earthworks? Uh, both. Um, yes. Yeah. So in the beginning of establishing this food forest here, we used, um, what we ended up going with was we would put sprinklers on stands um, and put them so that they would um, be up in the air um, and spray everywhere. And it kind of created like a hum humid effect for some of the plants that were getting hit up here and then making sure that we could get everything everywhere without laying drip lines everywhere. Um, you could totally lay drip lines. That would be smart. You could, you could do that. But sometimes it's tough because, you know, this food forest site was not laid out in rows. It was laid out um, in a wiggly fashion. Um, so it is patterned, but um, there aren't a lot of straight lines in this food forest. And so it became a challenge to do something more traditional with irrigation, like laying lines on the ground. Um, so we did, we went with an overhead watering system, which can, you know, cause some issues if, with mildew if you, if you overdo it. So um, you want to be kind of careful about that. Um, and if it's a smaller site, um, even if it's wiggly, I say drip line's a good way to go. And our market gardens, we also, we use um, a drip line on our beds and they are straight rows and they're planted out in polycultures. And so the, every so often we might do a soak of that um, system by doing an overhead watering, but we tend to try to stay away from overhead watering on the annuals. Um, what is the so, minimum yeah. space required for a food forest? Well, I don't know. I mean, in Portland, Oregon, on, in a very urban site, it's like 12th and Hawthorne area, there's a food forest growing in the edges of a sidewalk all around the building that's there. And it's an urban food forest. It's small. I mean, you could, you could consider, I guess it's kind of subjective. There's probably... Uh, different opinions on that. Um, I do think that half acres kind of a good um, place to start, but you could do it in a in a yard that's a fourth acre, an eighth acre. I mean, you could make your landscape um, a food forest, basically. And um, so, I don't know if there's really any minimum area because you can you can utilize these methods in any amount of space, even if you just had one self pollinating key species in a guild around it. I don't know if you would call that a food forest, but you could call it a food forest plant guild. Um, so, I mean, the, the bigger, it, you have to be kind of careful too about, it, if you're trying to do this yourself and you're scaling up a lot, you may not be able to maintain it, um, which, you know, I've gotten too big for my britches a lot with doing food forestry. Um, but then that's when your community comes into play, like going back to reference, um, the Amazon being a food forest and the people who live there, the indigenous populations of people, um, 
caring for that as a community, um, generation after generation, it's part of their culture to, to care for the forest and, and yield products from the forest and to continue to um, establish it and so on and so forth. So it's not really meant to be done alone. I think it is something that our culture should embrace as yeah. community and on, on a community level. And I feel like we're building community here <laughs> in the chat box too, because of Laura Thiessen and Meg Mitchell, I'll be sure to connect you guys via email. <laughs> they want to see each other's backyards. Cool. And is a polyculture the same as a plant guild? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Some people might make a distinction between those two things, but um, I, I consider them to be like synonymous terms. Okay. And do you use succulents such as aloe in your food forests? Well, aloe doesn't overwinter here, but I do use sedums, which is a kind of type of succulent. And actually, from my knowledge, all sedums are edible. Um, they, um, so yeah, you can, you can put those everywhere in your food forest. Um, what did you plant in front of the blackberry to hold them in check? Well, um, uh, earlier I was kind of talking about that, planting some uh, buffers. You'll, you can Google around for that too. Um, buffers for black walnut guild. <laughs> um, oh, blackberry? Oh, you, oh, you can blackberry. do mulberry as one. And I actually, I think I have a guild on my phone. I, should, I can look it up. I can find it again. Is anybody familiar yeah. with food forests in Maryland? Um, there's a book that I was just Question. showing. And this person, if you just Google Catherine Bukowski, she is, and she did the research on all the food forests in the United States. So she has a map, mm -hmm. a Google map. You probably are on there. And this is a great community food forest garden book. Um, but yeah, Catherine mm -hmm. Bukowski would know where the, the food forests in Maryland are, even though, do you know, Dave? Yeah. yeah. And so to go question. back to the, the black walnut i've got a little guild that i saved on my phone because i thought it was interesting oh, but sorry. So a list of plants that tolerate juglong which is the chemical put out by black walnuts to tell other plants stay away from me i need my space um so white mulberry red mulberry hazelnut witch hazel saint john's wort um elderberry hawthorn pot marigold bee balm hosta hostas are also edible Solomon seal, sedum, pansy, and violet. And so that's actually quite a lot of edibles that you can put with your black walnuts. Um, so that's what our plan is for the share it site. Um, you can see all the black walnuts back here. There's four big black walnuts back here. Um, and that's something that's on my to-do list. It's really mostly just like a lawn with some blackberries and um, lemon balm coming up that we try to keep on top of. But um, that's kind of part of our long-term plan for the site is getting guilds established beneath the black walnuts. That's wonderful. I just typed all as many as I could catch from what you said on the chat box as well. Um, let me see. How long did it take to establish? Sure. So they say that food forests take eight years to come into a maturity where they're all kind of like vibing together. Um, so this, this picture is showing on the screen a th three year time span. Um, and it's, it's looking a lot more like a, like a forest or like a woodland ecosystem now. Um, at first we kind of had felt like we had to joke around a lot and say, yes, it is a food forest. It's not just like sticks in the mud. Um, <laughs> Cause everything when it's dormant doesn't look terribly impressive. Um, but when in bloom and everything, all the foliage is popping, it, it starts to kind of take shape. You can see some of the structures taking place. Um, and as the fruit trees mature, you see some more of that structure taking place and, and everything at the beginning can be very low to the ground and not look very dynamic. So yeah, eight years to, to come into per, uh, maturity for a food forest, but you can start to see some yields in the first year if you do the method I was talking about of planting annuals in with your perennials. And then, um, you know, every year forward is good. I've, I've heard the, about gardening in the first year, sleep, second year, creep, 
third year leap. So, and you can see in this picture, this is the third season and it was, it really leapt, you know, it took off. And so you're kind of waiting for a while. I'd say year three is when things really start to take off. Oh, um, how do get, so here's Valerie asking the question about the sun slope. How do plants get enough? Sa, uh, so many, how do plants get enough sun under the shade of the black walnut trees? And then another question on if you're planting a bare root apple tree, when can you graft other varieties into it? Well, um, so the sun slope takes into account like the long term um, expected growth of each plant. And so if you're, you're putting, um, and then I also kind of arched a slope up away from the path edges. And so um, if we're looking at this picture here, I have low growing plants along the path sloping up towards some species, key species. And same thing here, low growing species sloping up towards the high, to the higher um, growing species. Um, with the black walnuts, being at the north, we were able to um, design everything in front of this as south facing. Um, we got, it was a very ideal site, south facing with black walnuts on the north side. So we don't experience any adverse shade from the black, black walnuts. Beneath the black walnuts it is quite shady. Um, and that's where my black walnut guild that I was talking about earlier would come into play. Um, and all of the things that do well beneath them are also shade shade loving or shade tolerant plants like you know the violets and pansies hosta salmon seal those are things that like to grow in the shade and so um they also happen to tolerate juggling so great great um solutions for those black walnuts um i feel like there was another question in there that oh, I, planting a bare root apple tree when can you graft other varieties onto it oh okay um I, my understanding of grafting is that it's best to do it during dormancy. Um, I am not an experienced grafter, so I'm going to say that I, I'm just going to pass on that question. Okay, great. Okay, so lots. it's 9.07, and I want to respect everyone's time because it is 9. We did want to end at 9 o'clock. Um, so, Dave, do you want to do the drawing of whoever's left for um, the one who will win? Melissa's one hour remote consultation, garden consult. Sure, uh, I've got a little random number generator. So I've uh, entered that in and the winner is Maria Harries. Maria Harries. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Tell us where you're from, Maria. <laughs> she's so excited. I'm sure she's like seriously texting. <laughs> um, Portland, Oregon. Oh, does it need to be remote now? <laughs> I was just going to say, even though it's for a remote consultation, if you're local, I'll come see your site so we can talk about it more in depth. Um, wow. How about that? Perfect person. Just so providential. Wonderful. Okay. Um, there's still some, <laughs> they're just keeping on answering their questions and asking questions. Melissa, man, Melissa, um, Belize, Belize, everybody says, <laughs> congratulations. See, this is so wonderful. Um, yes, some questions on grafting in March and permies everywhere. <laughs> Frigioni has a YouTube channel if anybody's interested on food forestry. Awesome. <laughs> Lion Waxman, you'll have to watch the replay <laughs> or, or scroll up to the He's, he's asking, what plants did you say again? Well, black un under the black walnut. Or scroll up, because I typed it into the chat box. And just cut and paste what I typed. Thank you so much, Michelle Ness. Uh, Michelle Ness says. All right, so. Thank you guys for complete sale. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, um, yes, I'm going to call it a night. And Melissa, you don't have a closing song for us, do you? <laughs> I I don't. <laughs> no worries. Are you? You said you were an artist, right? Do you sing or? Uh, I don't know. I I'm just kind of an all around weirdo. I like to dabble. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I'm Wonderful. a photographer. I like old film photography is my thing, probably overall, oh. and I do. Like too. So. Awesome. Well, we'll. You should. We should do a. You should. I'm sure a movie about your food forest is in the making. 
We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. I'm going to end with a, uh, a song from a perma permaculture um, singer in Australia. And it's No Such Thing as Waste. And we'll call it a night as we say goodbye to you. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's not coming through. Oh, it's not? No. Nah. Okay, sorry.